closer. Keep wondering in. All right, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning. As you know, this whole series has been a huge success and has gotten so much traction. So we're just going to keep going and keep going and keep finding amazing people in the community who can come in and share with us different aspects of mental emotional wellness. So I've known Megan. It's been a good three, yes, four, eight, uh, more than that. Maybe more than that. Okay, maybe yeah. more like eight or nine. <laughs> anyway, I've known Megan for a long time. Um, and we, we do similar work, or let me just say our work overlaps a lot in the community, mm-hmm. wanting to make sure that children and families have the resources they need so that they can thrive. Megan works with Family Connection, which some of you may or may not have heard about. She's going to tell a little bit about what they do, but they truly offer amazing support to families across the state of South Carolina with a humble loving, caring heart, and just personal attention. It's absolutely fabulous. So with school starting and that Mm -hmm. stress ramping up for children and families, Megan's here to talk to us about the kinds of supports that children may need, Mm -hmm. especially stepping back into the classroom, Mm -hmm. so that if any of us have godchildren, children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, next door neighbors, literally yesterday I was talking to my next door neighbor and their little boy is three and they're he gets frustrated because he can't really understand anything he's saying. And I was like, okay, let me not <laughs> let me not step into teacher mode, but I will at some point. Um, and say, you know, I wonder if maybe it would be helpful for him to get, like, maybe it's just like a speech screening and just see what's going on. Mm-hmm. I try to rein myself in, like, when, when I'm in public, but... Uh, <laughs> really hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. Um, so anyway, Megan's uh, here to talk to us about all those resources that are available in the community. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you, darling. Thanks. Thank y'all so much. And good morning. Good I wore morning. my most colorful dress because I knew Deborah would have her <laughs> on. Um, so, and I grew up in the Lutheran Church, so it feels like coming home today. So thank y'all so much. Um, it's been great to be here with y'all this morning. And like Deborah said, we. Um, our kindred spirits um, and have connected in this work and my journey to family connection ha- has been years in the making. Um, I have a background in social work and have lived in South Carolina for almost 20 years. Um, my uh, done different nonprofit work over the years. My family, we've, we've grown our family through adoption, so um, from a little four pound you know, special care nursery graduate to now a seventh grader, which has been like, I don't know how that happened, Um, but everything that that comes along with that. So I have the personal and the professional, um, you know, piece of this work. So like Deborah said, hopefully what I'll share with you all this morning is just some things to think about, a little bit about the work that we do, and then as you all leave today knowing who to call if you have questions. You go home, you talk to your friends, your family, your neighbors, knowing that Family Connection is a resource. Um, so I am going to jump in and um, just start a little a video, hopefully, that will kind of show you our work. Family Connection is the parent training and information center for the state of South Carolina. We are the largest family-serving organization in our state offering programs and trainings to all 46 counties at no cost to families. Our employees are parents of children or youth with a disability, chronic health condition, or behavioral health diagnosis. Our services include collaborating with parents on how to prepare for special education meetings, including the Individualized Education Plan, 504, and Individualized Family Service Plan, Assisting parents in navigating the systems of medical care and insurance coverage for their children with disabilities or special health care needs. Matching parents seeking information and support with mentor parents and providing programs and services addressing a variety of needs. We host workshops, conferences, webinars, and trainings for parents, youth, and professionals throughout the year. Our staff offers one-on-one assistance to increase parent and family understanding of the education process. Having a child with a disability or special health care needs means parents face questions about medical care, insurance, and service options. Our health care team answers questions regarding Medicaid, TEFRA, appeals, and managed care information. We can provide applications and support in person or over the phone. For more than 30 years, Family Connection has been making connections, raising awareness, and promoting inclusion for those with disabilities or specialized health care needs. 
Family Connection is there for every milestone of a child's journey from birth to adulthood. So some of you might have recognized Catherine Paget in the, mm -hmm. one of the pictures. Um, I know she's, she texted me last night, so I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to be there, but um, Catherine is a dear friend and colleague and works with uh, works at Family Connection. And as you all saw in the video, I, again, a lot of us come to this work because of our personal um, experiences with, our, with families. Um, and so that's really the difference, I think, for our work and a lot of other um, nonprofits that we work with is that we're living it. You know, we're, we're, our, our staff are living with children, uh, you know, and our, our families who have disabilities, special health care needs. So as we're navigating it, we're also trying to help other families navigate it. So the lessons that we learn, you know, trying to share and impart that, some of that wisdom um, on our journey uh, to families that may be experiencing a very similar situation. So our work is really also centered around strong family engagement. We know that when families are engaged and are have the information, they're going to be able to make the best decisions for their families or, and for their children. So we're really here to work alongside of them. We're not here to say, this is exactly what you need to do and do this, 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 and this, and this, but really here are your options and you can decide what's going to be best for you. Um, because again, not every journey is the same and even though we have um, families where we, our children may have similar diagnoses, it, it can vary tremendously and we may be at a different point than another family is in terms of accessing resources or applying for services and so just knowing that everyone's going to come at this at, you know, from a different perspective but they're still going to leave with the information to decide this is what's going to be right for my children. So our, our services are kind of in three parts and three buckets. So we have our peer support services, which are our one-on-one -on -one support. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but this really includes our direct work with families navigating the education system. So trying to decide, kind of like Deborah said, do I need to talk to my child's preschool teacher, their elementary teacher about an evaluation for services because I notice they're struggling, or I need to get my child um, one of those IEPs. I need to get them an individualized education plan to make sure that they're receiving the accommodations and supports that they need in school. Um, we also work one-on-one -on -one with families navigating health care, so that might be applying for health care services like TEFRA, Medicaid, or applying for other waivers that allow a child to see different specialists without a family having to go or you know, come into a tremendous amount of medical debt just for the child to get the services that they need. Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one support uh, through our wonderful volunteer um, support parents. So these are parents that are trained, that have had a personal experience and are there just to be that other person on the phone that you can text, you know, late at night or first thing in the morning, like, I'm really struggling today. How did you, how did you handle this? Or can you give me any words of wisdom? Just be that emotional support. Um, and they're families that get matched. We have families from different parts of the country that get matched specifically based on their child's diagnosis. So we have families that come to us and their child has a very rare genetic disorder, and we may find a family in Nevada that through our network that we're able to connect them to um, and just have that, that person um, to be there. So we've got, that's a really the core of our work, is that one-on-one -on -one support with families. Um, and then training and education, like today, doing a lot of in-person virtual trainings where we cover a lot of different topics. Um, go in, and I'll share a little bit about those in a little bit. So more in depth about parenting skills, resources, things like that. And then just outreach and information, um, going to community events, making back to school, of course right now are big, back to school events, making sure that families know as they're coming back into a school year, resources are available so they can start the school year right. So, um, why do families call Family Connection of South Carolina? <clears throat> There's a lot of reasons. Families call us because they don't, first of all, they're like, my doctor just told me, or my child's teacher told me I need to call you, what do you do? So just letting them know that, hey, we're a free resource. We can help you if you have a child that's um, birth to 26. Um, we'll provide services in Spanish or in English. If you speak another language, we'll work with one of our providers to get translators for them. Um, and we're going to be here offering that service to you for as long as you need it. You may call us, you're like, I need this one thing to figure out this application, and I'm good. Or 
we are really struggling in fifth grade and I don't know how we're going to navigate this and we're going to work with you you know as long as needed um, and at any point if you need to come back to us you can come back to us or this happens very often we work with a family who has a child in the NICU their child's um, born prematurely spend some time in the NICU and we, we get them home, get them settled, and then a couple years later we hear from them again when they're starting kindergarten, which is great because we're like, oh yeah, we worked with you then, call us again because now they're trying to figure out how do I navigate a whole different world um, as, our as our children get older. Um, but you can see, this is just a list of a resource, or a list of reasons why families will call us. Um, and it just depends on what's going on in the family's life. A lot of times, they may be connected to no services whatsoever. We have a lot of families that come to us, new to the state, have no idea. They're like, we have this in Tennessee, do y'all have this here? They're like, we'll figure out how to like translate. What's the equivalent of that? Um, or there's families with a lot going on, and there's families with multiple children, and all of these concerns for each of their children. So our approach is to figure out what is the parents primary concern what is the thing that's important to them to help work through and take these things a piece, you know pieces at a time do y'all have any questions so far do we have time for questions at the end but i want to make sure we don't miss them. yes so um did you say that everybody who's on the staff is also the parent of a special needs child most of us are yes and the other thing is um how big, and you said this is the largest nonprofit that does this in the state. So, how big is the staff yeah. and how many parents? Great question. So, we've been around for over 30 years. Um, we are the only organization that is designated in South Carolina as a parent training and information center. It's a federal designation we get under education. We also have a, a designation as the, what's called the Family to Family Health Information Center. So these are national, um, federal organizations and grants that they get, to, they get a family connection and have for years um, to be that entity. Our staff right now, um, gosh, we have over 30 staff across the state. We also have our board members that have a personal connection, many of them also <coughs> parents. Um, and for staff, we're either parents, caregivers, um, siblings, um, or we have, or they have some type of work, maybe in special education services, in healthcare. So they're coming at it from that perspective as well. So our services are across the state. Our staff are across the state. Most of them are here in Columbia. I told Deborah um, our office is right in Forest Acres. I had a bunch of materials, but our flooring is being redone. So I was like, I can't even get into the office or print anything. But I said, I'll make sure to get this to y'all after. Um, but most of us are here in Columbia with staff all over. We have our bilingual team also all over the state um, just to help connect families to services. So, great question. Thank you. Yes. I'm an old guy. I learned what LOL means. What does, <laughs> what does TEFRA mean? Oh, great question. <laughs> I love it. Um, thank you. So, we'll, we'll get to that. But I will tell you the short, is, the short of it is uh, TEFRA Medicaid. So, TEFRA is a, was a tax. It, it makes no sense in the terms of like policy and legislation. It's government. It's government. So oh. say, so, you know, say that, and then we're like, okay, knowledge, move on. But basically, it's a category of Medicaid okay. that allows for children who have special needs to get Medicaid regardless of their parents' income. So it doesn't look at the, the parents' income; it just looks at the child. Thank Great you. question. Yes, our world is full of acronyms. Too many of them. Any other questions I can address? Yeah. Just uh -huh. broaden parents for us. You may have yes. said this earlier. I'm uh -huh. sorry I was doing this. No, 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 broaden good. parents for me. So mm -hmm. like if you have non-functioning parents or non-present parents, yes. it extends to all of it. Yeah, so we have um, like grandparents, grandparents. yes, we have, um, you know, so certainly biological parents, but if there's a kinship, which might be a grandparent, aunt, uncle, or family member, other friend or family member raising the child, um, foster parents, um, maybe parents um, that are pre-adoption, um, um, might be even siblings. We have a lot of uh, families that have uh, older siblings that are raising their younger siblings. So we cover all of it. We talk, we spend a lot of time talking to grandparents as well. So anybody who's that point of contact for that child, helping to make that decision, that's who we're gonna connect and work with. So thank you. Okay, good, just wanna make sure we got to this. Okay, so um, uh, my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Sally Baker is our director of education and she has a background um, in ed and 
she had done a training and we had talked a lot about um, kind of reducing back to school stress because it is stressful for everyone and I think that oftentimes while it's an exciting time sometimes that gets overlooked that it can be a really stressful time especially for students who have um, a disability who are navigating back to school a new schedule change in environment, um, new people, it can be very overwhelming. And as parents, trying to help our children navigate that can also be very overwhelming. So in talking with Sally um, and talking with some of the teachers that she works with, obviously talking with some of our parents as well, these are some things that we have, um, have our parents will say, this is what's helped us. This is what we find is the most useful as we're navigating that. So obviously building that collaborative relationship with teachers um, and starting early and um, I'll tell you from my own personal experience you know my daughter's in seventh grade this year and we're navigating um, you know trying to figure out how do we manage our ADHD how do we make sure we're taking our medication how do I make sure that the teachers know kind of what's going on um, and so trying to be very proactive at the start of the year and just messaging all, you know, middle school you have like, it feels like a hundred teachers, but messaging all of them and saying, hey, just letting you know, here's what's happened since last year, here's some things we're working on at home, just letting you know, so we can kind of establish that two-way communication. Um, and they're, they have kind of an awareness of what's going on. Most of them already know her, but some of them don't. And trying to figure out how are we, teacher and parent, gonna work together this school year to make sure she gets what she needs. Um, letting them know, letting teachers know what um, their, your child does well. Now, oftentimes it's easy to come in and say, they struggle with this, 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 this. These are the things that we're having problems with, which no doubt should be recognized, but also letting them know this is what they do really well and this is what their interests are. If you can give them an opportunity to work hands on or work in groups with each other, that's really where they excel. One of the pieces I wanted, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, is this um, Your Child's Journey book, we have this on our website, but I'm gonna get Deborah a stack of these, a box of these to share with you all. Um, and I love this book because it's organized into sections where a family can track education, what's going on with education, their child's health care. Um, but it starts with about me. So it starts with this really nice opening where the parent or the child, depending on their age, can like say, this is who I am. This is what I like, um, here are my interests. My, my favorite things and so it's a good place for not only families to keep this information but in having these conversations with teachers say this is my kid this is what they like this is some of the things that they're into um, when they're happy they do this when they're sad they do this so using some of these resources as a way just to organize our thoughts put it all down on paper and then help to have those conversations so we can get all copies of this too um, so the other thing is, again, trying to decide as a parent, what information do you want shared um, back and forth from, from school and, and how do you want this information shared? So again, depending on if there's a lot of teachers, maybe a lot of therapists that a child's working with, it can be overwhelming to get all of that information. So deciding what works best for you, for your family up front and saying, you know, if I can get a weekly summary of like what went well or what are some things we need to work on next week or if it's I need to be face to face with you and I need to be in person and I'd like to sit down with you once a month or whatever throughout the semester and talk about what's going on. So deciding what's going to work best for your child and for your family in terms of getting that communication so that you're not being overwhelmed, inundated with it, and you can use it and decide what's, what to do next. <coughs> um, things like we talked about with parents that we work with, that was a great question. Um, family dynamics are fluid, things are changing. So uh, talking to, to teachers about who can and can't pick up my child, who can make decisions. If I'm um, you know, the current foster parent, um, I just need you to know I'm the, I'm the foster parent. And, you know, for whatever's going on with custody, mom or dad aren't allowed to be around, or they're only allowed to be involved in these certain situations. So being upfront to let the teachers know kind of, this is who can pick up my child or who can make decisions about my child is helpful too. Um, and then making sure all of those health information forms are completed, the medications at school, everyone kind of knows um, 
what's going on, the nurse is aware, um, you know, we ourselves kind of went through that, like, oh yeah, we um, did not complete the, she, the nurse called us the other day and she's like, I need your EpiPen form. I know you did one last year and I was like, oh yes, thank you for reminding me. I need to send you the new form to say, if she needs it at school, here's what to do and here's the medication, right? So things like that of just trying to make sure at the start of the year, again, having something like this to organize and say, oh, these are all my medical rec, my child's medical records um, or their allergies, medication, I can just easily transfer this over to the next thing and get it to the school and or the child care center as well. Okay, at home. So again, this is the, um, this is a, a constant uh, changing and evolving thing. Uh, you know, trying to navigate the back to school routine and the adjustment that comes from the summer to the start of the school year. Um, but establishing routines and environments that help your child. We work with a lot of families that have children on the autism spectrum. And that autism spectrum can be wide and varied in terms of what their diagnosis, their abilities are. Um, and so it's gonna have to be very specific to the child. And a lot of this, as we tell parents, it's very frustrating, but it's very it's trial and error. You're gonna find stuff that like, that worked last year. It is not gonna work this year. How do we figure out how to navigate that? Um, so trying to decide and determine, when my child comes home after school, do they need downtime? Have they been overstimulated all day? A lot of sensory stuff, a lot of noises, people, um, sounds, smells, all of that. Do they need to come home and be somewhere quiet? for a little bit and have some downtime? Or do they need to get moving? Do they need to be active? They've been sitting still all day long and if they sit still all day long and then they come home and they're having to like sit down again, there's gonna be a meltdown, right? So do they need to get up, moving, walking, going to the playground, whatever it is. So trying to decide what that, that downtime after school piece looks like, because that's the tough part, right? The transition from you've been in school all day and you've had these rules to, to live by, now you come home and we have maybe a different set of rules and expectations at home, and that can be where a lot of times it's very tough for families to figure out how do we make that transition at home so we can have you know, a nice evening together. Looking, things, looking at things like how, um, you know, how do they complete their homework, where do they complete it, Again, same sort of thing for our kids that might have autism or ADHD, having something to, to fidget with, right? The fidget toys or bounce or move around as they're doing <coughs> their homework, bless you. Um, do they need music or do they need quiet to work on you know, their homework? Do they need someone sitting right there beside them, helping them go through it? Or do I need to come and check back in, right, and decide? Um, and also, do I need someone else to come in and help me do that and help me find a tutor or someone else that can help me navigate that? And that's a lot of what we help families identify as well. Keeping everything organized in one place. I mean, y'all know you've opened the book bag at the end of the week and you're like, there's a nasty banana at the bottom of this thing. And like, papers are shoved down in there and you're like, this is a disaster. I just want to throw it away. But trying to figure out how to keep that organized so that there's a system you know, for you and helping to remind them of like, this is where a book bag goes, these are the papers. Um, and it, as best as we can, I mean, you know, it's August, we're all starting fresh. <laughs> we're gonna try to start strong. We'll see how well we do as the school year goes on. Um, but then again, just not forgetting that sleep um, meal routine as well, just making sure that that's, um, those routines are in as well so that kids are getting enough sleep um, and eating enough and we know that again for for some kids that it, that can be a, a challenge where um, if they're you know, they're maybe on the spectrum and where they have ADHD some type of neuro, neurotypical um, development and they're only eating certain foods right now so like that's their go-to food that's their safe food great fine we just want to make sure that they're having the opportunity to eat that, maybe introducing some new things as needed, and then they're just getting enough sleep um, at night so that they can function during the day and not be exhausted during the day. Any questions so far about that? Okay. Um, so this is, I think, the biggest thing that um, we have talked a lot about in our office, and I have a, have a colleague whose son started kindergarten, and he was explaining just kind of 
you know, to his grandmother what was going on at school, and um, you know, she was trying to kind of say, oh, it's fine, you know, it's fine, don't worry about that, or it's okay, you know, just kind of doing what we normally do. And he, you know, was telling his dad afterwards, he, he was really frustrated because he's like, Grandma doesn't know what's going on inside my body. And I was like, that's really insightful for a five-year-old, but also um, really good sort of check for us to say, we don't know, right? We, do, we don't know what's going on inside their little bodies, their brains as they're developing, and especially if they have a disability, what some might be challenges, barriers, just the way that they see the world might be a little bit different. Um, and so as we're talking about the stress, talking about providing kids with a safe space to navigate, if things are not, uh, if they're struggling with something, if they're not going well, if they're feeling overwhelmed, what do they do? How do they get their emotions out? How do they manage that? The thing I always equate this to is, in schools we spend a lot of time practicing drills, right? Tornado drills, fire drills, unfortunately, you know, lockdown drills now is the new thing. Um, but we do that, right? We practice that. That is, that is just accepted, common practice. But we don't practice drills with our kids of what to do in these situations, right? We don't practice, we don't have a plan usually to think about when you're feeling overwhelmed and you're gonna have a meltdown or you're gonna, there's some behavior that's gonna come out. We don't talk about how to manage that before it gets to a big meltdown, a behavior problem at school or at home. So making it just part of the regular conversation. Just like we practice what you do in the event of a fire, let's practice what to do if you feel overwhelmed in school. If someone says something to you or you don't know um, how to kind of process what's going on, what's your, your safe space? Who is your safe adult at school? We talked to our, um, our daughter about that and she has a fantastic um, uh, coach for archery and she's kind of her safe person because she's seen her in the classroom out of the classroom And she knows that if she's struggling or something's going on. She's her safe person to go to she can talk to her about I am feeling very overwhelmed and very frustrated and before I You know punch hit yell at someone I need to figure out how to manage that right um, and so thinking about regularly having those conversations and practicing that with kids can be really, really helpful. And then like we said about the communication too, um, back to the teachers, letting them know that's something we're working on at home. And here's our plan. Here's how we have decided is gonna be best for our child and here's how we're managing it. It would be really helpful if you did fill in the blank. You could really help us manage the stress, help them feel safe and know what to do by supporting us in that. So um, making sure that, again, our kiddos have the chance to advocate for themselves and also it helps to advocate for other students too. When they see other students that are struggling as well, giving them some of that self, those self-advocacy skills to navigate it. Yes, sir. I recently saw, I think it's Disney, mm -hmm. Inside Out. Mm -hmm. Where was that when I was? <laughs> I know. It's amazing. And, it's amazing. And I understand there's an Inside Out 2 where they yes. started at about 7th grade. Yes, yes. And all of that. Yeah. I think that should be required observation of any teacher. Yes. And I would hope that families are encouraged to see something like that. Yeah. You can get it online. It's a great point. Yeah, that's a wonderful movie and just normalizes talking about feelings and emotions and it's nothing to be scared of. It's just it's just how our bodies and brains work. Um, but knowing what to do, that's the, I think that's usually when families come to us and, and we've all experienced it where my kid has gotten suspended or um, there, is, there was some, an altercation at school and it was you know nine times out of 10, something that the child was overwhelmed or there was something else going on and, and it just pushed them too far and they were done and they reacted and then because schools have policies and they have to keep order in the classroom, the, the result was that child got suspended, right? And so now the family is in crisis trying to figure out, what do I do? Um, how do I gotta not be at work, my kid's at home, they're not getting services, like do I need to switch schools? So trying, you know, we're helping families navigate that because some of that's inevitable, but trying to prevent that in a lot of ways just by normalizing and talking about those emotions and feelings. So, great point, any other questions about that? Yes. It just makes me realize that, you know, can I even tune into myself as an yes. adult about that? Because here you're talking about helping yes. your child tune in. 
but um, do we even do this for ourselves? Like, uh, gosh, I'm really under stress, I'm getting scattered, I'm forgetting things. Mm -hmm. It gets worse as I get older, what should I be doing right now instead of, you know, I mean, you have to be tuned into yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely, great point. You really do, because you have to come at it from a place of like, I can respond to this and not react to it, which is very tough and a lot of unlearning uh, behaviors of how we were parented and even how we parented them at a certain age, just constant learning and adjusting. Um, there are some things, you know, in, you know, we joke, but um, but in all seriousness, you know, having mommy timeouts, you know, are helpful, right? And even just anybody, moms, dads, whoever, removing yourself from the situation, making sure that the child's okay. But if you're like, I'm really going to talk about this. I just had the worst day at work. A thousand things going on. I need to remove myself from this. Um, or you know, families that will tell us. We found out a way to kind of regulate ourselves by taking family walks or like it was for some families listening to music, um, uh, other movement. There's some great, these great cards you can find on Amazon and they're like movement cards are really good for little kids. But it's like do this pose or move like a, you know, elephant. And it's just getting them like connecting with their body. But the parents can do it too and be like, okay, we can have fun, we can play together and then we can try to figure out how to tackle some of these tough issues. But yes constantly, um, you know, a constant process. So, great point, thank you. Anything else from that? Okay, um, and the last little bit of time that we have um, together, I just wanna talk a little bit about our education program, because again, this is really where families come to us with questions. They're, they've tried to do all the things, right? We've, we're doing all the things to manage the stress, have the communication at school, but let's be honest, sometimes it's not enough just to do that, right? We also need some additional help to navigate services. So our education partner program is where we are matching families with one of our education specialists to help them determine what's the best, what's the best way for that child to succeed at school. Um, we're not special education advocates or attorneys. There are groups of organizations that do that, but our role is simply there as the support person to that parent, right? We're here, here to help the parent maybe communicate with the school where there's been a, a lack of communication or breakdown um, and let them know, here's, um, here's what we think is gonna be some best options for your child, right? So <coughs> oftentimes it's families coming to us and say, my child has a diagnosis. Um, let's use ADHD as an example. My, my, I talked to my doctor about this, but how do I get help at school? And because that is a totally different system, right? We have our medical, our healthcare, my background's in medical. So I'm like, Ed is like, I tell Sally all the time, like, it's a different world. I don't know what that acronym means, but give me like healthcare all day long. It's a totally different world to have to learn how to navigate and knowing that my doctor can't just write a prescription and I can take it to the school and say, you need to do this for my kid. It doesn't work like that. But there are education laws and resources that allow and require schools to put certain um, modifications or accommodations in place so that that child can learn. So families are coming to us, we're talking to them, determining what their concern is. Maybe they have an upcoming IEP meeting, it does individualized education plan, we need to help them prep for the plan, for the meeting. It may even go with them to the meeting, sit there. Again, remind them this is what we talked about beforehand, this is what this means, um, and then be there with them after, just to make sure the plan's being implemented and their kid's getting what they need and they feel like their questions and concerns have been addressed. So another great piece about the journey book is it does have that education piece up there where um, you know families can start writing down here are the things that we've noticed our concerns great behavior we need to talk to the school and determine how do we manage this and work with our kids so that they can get what they need and not be punished not be just dealing with these behavior after behavior and in a situation where they're getting you know suspended or expelled simply because they just have, uh, their brain works differently and they're just not getting what they need. So real quick, I do um, just wanna say that for our families, we really emphasize when we're working with them on education that this is your child's plan. IEP has certain parameters and the plan's gonna look, it's gonna, the template's gonna be the same, but it's gonna be based on what your child needs. And it's gonna be something that has to be adjusted and adapted as they age and go from grade to grade. Um, so thinking about what is the plan, just like we talked about, what is our plan for how to talk about behaviors, how to talk about our emotions, our feelings, what is our plan for when they're in school. 
And for, do you have a question? Okay. Do you have a question? No, okay. Um, we talked about um, those disability categories, right? So we have families that, again, their child's been diagnosed um, from their medical provider. But for education, they have to meet the requirements under the IDEA law. So individuals um, with Disabilities Education Act. So there's one, there's 13 categories. Um, this disability must be significant enough that it's gonna affect their education performance and that they may require some additional special education services. So these are the categories. 13 of them, pretty broad. Um, there's a lot of factors that schools look at when determining if that child falls into that category. I'll tell you, most, um, uh, you know, these, uh, the other health impairments category or, you know, the specific learning disability category, a lot of families will find that their child is in one category because they may have, like, one of those more general broad. Um, just because of the age that they're at, they haven't been diagnosed yet, um, or that they're still not, there's still a lot of questions, right? They're in the process of trying to figure out, does my child fit in this category or do they not? And I'll tell you as a parent, it can be a little overwhelming and a little scary, like I don't wanna label my child, but also I realize and I recognize I have to have them identified so that they can get services, right? So we talk a lot, especially with families who have a new diagnosis, really scary recognize that we're not labeling your your child they are more than their diagnosis they're more than their disability but in our current systems if we want to get some help and resources they have to fit into a category so just letting families know this is kind of these are the rules that we're playing by and getting them comfortable talking and thinking about how to get them evaluated and get access to services um, let me think I'm going to uh, skip that part. So um, I, there's a couple of resources here that I think for families who are trying to decide, again, this is in the journey book too, but just kind of planning before the meeting. So thinking for families, what is going to be, um, again, using the journey book, thinking about communication that you've had with your teacher, pulling your child's resources, helping to prepare. If you think there's something going on with my child, my grandchild, my neighbor's child that needs some help, how can we help like plan and prepare and think about, we need to have a conversation with school about getting an IEP. Or maybe we have an IEP and it's not working, so we need to have another meeting and figure out how do we fix that. Um, during the meeting, just some tips to think about how to come prepared, what questions to ask, having the plan in front of you, asking for clarification, um, you know, time to decide and think, is this going to be the right, taking the recommendations of the teachers. Again, back to developing that communication with teachers. It's a lot of it's just trust and respect that we can work together to meet this mutual goal, which is uh, making sure our, our kid has services. Um, and then after the meeting, which is like the lead up is to the meeting is usually the big thing, but then it's like, okay, we've done the meeting. Now what happens? Now making sure that families know you need to get a copy, make sure they give you a copy of your IE, your child's IEP. You can have it in a binder or a folder or, or a book to keep it all together. And then you can work through that and keep track of where you see your child meeting goals so that when you come back to that next meeting with your child's IEP team, you can talk about, I feel like my kid's really making some progress here. What's your, what's your take on it? Here are some things that we may want to work through because this is not working and we'd like to make some tweaks. So this is all part of our process with our education partners. So the parents are like, here's where I'm at, here's where I need help, walk me through this, and let's get to the next part. I don't want to forget our littles because our, as <laughs> Deborah knows, this is our, um, one of the biggest populations that we work with and can often be forgotten. Um, and we have older siblings that might be in elementary or up, but our littles, and for a lot of families, there may be questions or concerns, but they're like, ah, something in my gut is telling me that something's not right here, but I don't know what. Um, so we work with families through our education partner program. Um, this is an example, the ASQ, it's the ages and stages questionnaire. Oftentimes families will get this at the pediatrician's office. I'll tell you, my, my child's um, preschool teachers did this with her. It was really helpful, because they sat down, and it's just a parent or adult-led questionnaire, can my kid do this? Can they grab this, stand up, touch their toes? You know, those kind of things. Um, for those two and three-year-olds, 
and really help to identify. It's not going to tell you that this is definitely what's going on, but it's going to give some some uh, starting point to say maybe we need to follow up with like a, a developmental pediatrician, or maybe we need to talk to our pediatrician and get them screened, do another screening or something more in depth to see if there's a developmental delay or something else that's going on. So not forgetting to overlook our little ones too, that those are really critical times in these first couple of years of life. And we may be able to identify some services and then refer them to those early education support services too. Because those exist too. We have those services in K through 12. We have early ed, ed support as well. In South Carolina, it's called BabyNet. So it's making sure those little kids get access to early intervention um, and they can you know, progress on as they age and get services into the academic or the K through 12 system. Um, Deborah's heard me talk a lot about this and I want to just make a note of this too because it's an often missed population. For services are students who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we've been doing a series of trainings across the state working with our um, Department of Education and helping organizations, community members understand that homelessness may not look like we think it looks like in order for a child to get service. So under, again, another fe federal law, the McKinney-Vento Act, there are protections, just like there's protections for our, our kids under IDEA that have disabilities, so they have access to free and appropriate public education. We want to make sure there's no barriers for kids who have disabilities. We also want to make sure there's no barriers to accessing education for kids who are homeless or students who are homeless. And that can look like families who are doubled up, living with multiple family members for economic reasons, job loss. Um, it can also look like a um, maybe an older teen who's not, for whatever reason, not with their biological family and is couch surfing, maybe living with friends um, and kind of going from house to house might be families that are fleeing a domestic violence situation and they have to relocate. Um, so we want to make sure that those children are identified because <coughs> under this law, they're technically eligible for services. And the way to do that is connect them to every district has a McKinney-Vento liaison. So they have a point person who's going to make sure that child's eligible, get them into school as quickly as possible, and make sure they have things like book bags, school supplies, um, can, do the, does the parent need a, a gas car to get them back and forth to school? They're living in a hotel. Do they need a, a week-long stay to kind of get them stabilized? Um, so we want to make sure that those kiddos, those students, all ages, who might be experiencing one of these situations could be connected to a McKinney-Vento liaison um, to get those supports. So we're asking families as we're talking to them, like, hey, you know, we're kind of talking, tell me a little bit about your current situation, what's going on. And a lot of times they'll tell us this is what's going on. And we're like, great, did you know that there is someone, there are resources for you? Nine times out of ten, they don't know. Most of us didn't know until we got into this work that these services were available. So I mention it because you may know someone or um, you may have, you may come across someone who could be eligible. You can always call us and connect to us or encourage them to call us and we'll get them to those resources. Um, TEFRA, oh, I'm not going to forget TEFRA. Last thing um, is healthcare, my world. Um, so um, we're taking care of kids on the ed side. We also want to make sure we're taking care of them on the, the medical, right, the healthcare side of it too. So we work with families to apply for Medicaid. Maybe they need to apply for SSI, Social Security, disability income. Maybe they need to look at how do I navigate my private insurance and then getting these specialty services for my child? I can't get my kid to the doctor, but we don't have transportation, but we have Medicaid. So we can use Motive Care, which is the Medicaid um, transportation system to get them to and from these doctor's appointments. Again, a lot of times families are like, I'm struggling with this and I don't know who or what service gets me <laughs> there. That's why they come to us and work with our healthcare team on it. Um, we have a lot of that on our website, and we have um, the TEFRA application. It's 26 pages, oh, and, and we go. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, that sounds right. And it's not, it's only in English. It's not translated in any other language. <laughs> but we will work with families line by line, page by page. They can go down and apply for it. And again, this is fantastic that a lot of families don't know. You can keep your private insurance. Um, and it doesn't look at the family's income, like other Medicaid or other eligibility categories. It's only going to look at the child. And it's going to look at their diagnosis. So if they, again, back to those ed categories, those are a lot of the same ones, right? Is it severe enough that they need additional support and additional Medicaid coverage, additional insurance coverage? They can go to their specialist and that family's not paying out of pocket for a lot of their care, right? So we're gonna work with them, go through every page, get it, get them applying for it, bless you, um, so that they can get healthcare um, that they, they need. Um, I'll make a quick plug for our trainings. We have a training calendar. Um, we have a series of virtual trainings coming up. This is the next one on September 26th. It's actually part of a series. It's a series of three, but you can pick it up at any point. Um, and it's a focusing on parenting skills. So helping your child reach their potential when you're parenting a child who has a disability. Um, so that's a virtual one. We'll do it on Zoom. It's free to register. Parents can go online. Anyone can go online. We have a lot of professionals that go online, child care providers, teachers, uh, early interventionists that will go register for it and then share this information with their families. But we have that on our training calendar. And then our contact information. I have a couple of my cards up here, but you can always, um, parents can call our support information line. We also have an online referral form. So if families can go online and put in a referral, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your child. Um, and they can make a referral perhaps to have them have us reach out to them or they can call our information line and talk to one of our, our team members and get that one-on-one -on -one support There's a lot of different ways to get in touch with us um, but i know we're getting close on time so i'll make sure we have time for questions too before we wrap up yes is this organization when it is in other states called the same it's not great question, but it um, there are yeah <laughs> right. So um, there are organizations like ours that also have those two federal designations where they have the healthcare and they have the parent training and information center. Um, but they're going to be called something different in every state. But we'll help families find them. So we have families that maybe are moving to another state or coming from, and we want to connect them. So we can connect and find which state. And we're all, we have colleagues across the country where we'll reach out. North Carolina is a common one where um, we'll connect with them and just let them know that there's a family in North Carolina looking for services. It's going to look a little, maybe have a different name, look a little different in terms of how they provide their services. But generally speaking, there's going to be one in every state. There isn't a, a yeah. directory, is there? There is, yes. Oh, wow. Yes, That's there is. <laughs> That's a so. score for the government. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So there is, um, and usually through, it's, um, we have a, a, a directory on our website, too, um, so you can find that there. Um, but there is, usually under Family Voices, is a national group that kind of pulls that directory together. And they bring us together for conferences, trainings, so we can connect and learn. Um, from each other so but yes but anyone who has those grants um, is listed on on that directory yeah definitely so let me know if you're looking for a service in another state yeah. I was going to point out Abby Cobb who is the lead yeah. social worker in Richland too uh -huh. is the liaison for Richland School District too as far as um, children experiencing homelessness or housing instability <coughs> so we all already love and adore and work closely with Abby on a lot of other projects yes. So just that, that just to know that that's that warm connection there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, she's amazing. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. I just say thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Where were you 35 years ago? Oh, old? I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, this is awesome. Really thank you. This is totally you. awesome. Yes. For those Thanks. of us that have dealt with all that and, that and the pushy parent. I mean, no. seriously, and it's all your fault. Right. Yes. Yeah. What our um, what do we say? Uh, pleasantly persistent, or is, is a phrase <laughs> that we're like We're like we're we're not pushy. We're pleasantly persistent, mm -hmm. uh, but really we're having to advocate and say because there are no services that we need our kids to get services. So we got here as soon as we could, but we're here That's 30 awesome. years later. Sure, so yeah. trying to and a lot's changed and still changing, which is great. A lot of our work is focused on talking with Medicaid, talking with Department of Education, be like this isn't working. 
our families are telling us this is not working and we have a contract with you and we need to make this work mm -hmm. so how do we make that happen um, and really using families that are advocating for themselves and their their children to tell us and now we can take that on and take it to the next level of actually make, you know help make something happen at a larger level so thanks. yes to be um, if we have an issue as a family or yes. as a individual mm -hmm. to realize that the teacher that we're going to be working with is working with 20, yes. 25, 30 yes. individual right. people mm -hmm. and to be aware that that teacher is going to have stress moments Absolutely. and uh, all yes. those things. So yes. be gentle, but yes. be persistent. Right, yeah. exactly. Great point. Yes. Recognizing that like, hey, we have a lot going on that you're dealing with in your classroom. We're, we want to be a partner in this as much as we can help alleviate your stress or help you. We're here as parents to do that too in our role, yeah. And especially when you get to middle school and high school, yeah. because an elementary teacher has, quote, just right. 20 or 30 children <laughs> in their <laughs> class. Yeah. <laughs> but a middle school or high school teacher could have six class periods yeah. with 20 to 30 children. Right. So that's like up to 150 children that yes. they're seeing every single day. Yes. So they may not even remember your child's name, not because they don't care, mm -hmm. but just because you're like, wait, okay, second period. Oh yeah, that quiet kid in the back on the left. Um, yeah, 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 I know who you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I, I think your point is. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And having that, even sometimes it's that one, I mentioned my daughter's coach. I mean, like sometimes I can just go to her and be like, I know you're not teaching her this year, but I'm really struggling. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions or how I can like help, you know, her on this um, or, you know, kind of work together? Um, it's it's um, it's definitely overwhelming on all on all sides, but I think you know we're all, we're all trying to do our piece of it to figure out how we we make it best for our kids. So we have time for some more questions. Just a few comments. Uh, Kath, our our Catherine Pageant mm -hmm. uh, be another connection with family connections. Uh, Deborah, I was thinking through the presentation this morning, like McKinney Bento Act, uh, the other acronyms, the different programs that are there. Uh, and our work for justice in the, in the community. Uh, Deborah does her job as advocacy at the state level, and so it's always advocating for programs. One thing in, in this larger emotional mental wellness umbrella, uh, we know that many years ago there was a whole movement like that emotional mental wellness programs just got disfunded and disappeared, and we've seen that even decades later how that's created challenges with people who experience homelessness all those sorts of things so as you as you think through as a, as a time of year think through if you're talking like local officials state representatives now whatever you're thinking like make sure you're asking these questions like what is your what is your position on things like this right mm -hmm. or on whether it's mckinney vento act or supporting programs for you know you can wrestle with that however you want to wrestle with that but that part of this emotional mental wellness journey is asking questions about this is important and are we continuing because all those things she's listed there right are very important if they disappear like all emotional mental wellness things disappeared several decades ago mm -hmm. that can be that can be difficult at a local level mm -hmm. county level and a state level wherever it may be so uh, and just continue to ask those questions and pray over those things as well as we seek to reach out to the least mm -hmm. of these among among us whatever that may be which is a great segue because <laughs> the children's committee hearings yes. are coming up um next month the children's committee is a state level committee it's made up of state senators and state representatives and the heads of every single agency mm -hmm. so the department of disabilities and special needs department of health and environmental control department of mental health department of juvenile justice department of education it goes on and on so there's an opportunity every year to be in the room with those people and have three minutes at the microphone to talk about any concern that you have about children. It's the children's committee. So anything, it could be yeah. about housing, it could be about education, it could be about emotional wellness. And you as a citizen, active in your democracy, have a microphone for three minutes and have all those people listening yes. to you. So if you're interested in either attending or participating, testifying at those hearings, there will be one here in Columbia, they just announced the dates on Thursday so I don't have them memorized yet but if you're interested in participating talk to me and I'll help you get signed up to be there absolutely it's a great way if you want some individual conversation yeah. there's five or six minutes and uh, the, the, the Lord be with you and also, and also with you, you. Let us pray. Mm -hmm. well God we do give you thanks for all those who respond to the call to be witnesses of light and love for families and children and all of 
who are struggling in whatever ways it may be, uh, to remind us that we are all precious children of God and that you have called us to be uh, strings of light shining together to make this world a better place. Uh, one, uh, one child, one person, one parent, one family member, one family at a time. Uh, we ask for your blessings upon Megan and the work of Family Connections that you would continue to strengthen and guide them in all the ways they sh share beacons of your love and what they do every day. For it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I wanted to make sure you knew Carl said leave this part set up if he's using